we're going to talk more about Dutch social housing and, and, and an organization, and we're going to move on to think slightly more about the concept of self-organization within that and beyond. And I'm going to hand over to Arno van Roosmalen, sorry for the bad pronunciation, who is, um, has organized and is going to moderate this panel. Arno, thank you very much. Thank you, and I hope it's not, it's a cliffhanger and not a hangover, like you said, the previous talk. Cliffhanger, hangover, you know. This is the thing. Okay, super. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Arno van Roosmalen. In daily life, I'm a director of Stroom Den Haag, and I'm being asked by SCORE to moderate this part of the, of the program. Um, thank you, Arnold Reindorp, for the, for the very nice lecture. Um, I, I think what, what is uh, very nice about the lecture of Arnold that is where he ended with, he said uh, the social should be something of citizens, not of the state or the market. And I think um, what we will talk about in this part of the program is how to organize this. How do we organize this, especially in, our, in the current situation of economic crisis? Um, a few details. How do you know that a half-nude man bare feet is homeless. I was wondering. Maybe he owns a villa somewhere. Okay. Um, I'll switch to this microphone. If it's working. Yes, it is. Um, the title of this, of this program is Dutch Housing Policy and the Right to Self-Organize. To Self-Organize. Uh, being organized by SCORE, this symposium is driven by the underlying crucial question what the role is that art can play in the discussions on and I would like to add in the practice of new forms of community and on changing definitions of the social in relation to housing. Can cultural production be a true tool with which to design and defend social space? The program is as follows. Um, there will be presentations by two excellent speakers, very passionate speakers, I'm convinced of, who take different positions, I think, uh, on the specter of the subject of this program. Uh, first is Adri Duiverstein. He is alderman, uh, I think it would be translated as Sustainable Spatial Development, Duurzame Ruimtelijke Ontwikkeling of the city of Almere since 2006. The city of Almere, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a you, you could call it a new town, probably a very new town, uh, um, that is about to develop into becoming, I think, the fourth biggest town of Holland. Um, I think Adri Duifstein was raised in the Schilderswijk uh, in The Hague, which is uh, uh, considered uh, uh, one of the current, I already forgot the name, of the Secretary of State, but one of the, the poor areas, um, one of the Vogelaanwijken, so one of the 40 poor areas in the Netherlands that need to be redeveloped. Um, he has a, has a history in local politics in that city, in The Hague, and has been engaging very strongly with um, both city planning and uh, urban renewal. And the impression if, is if, uh, if you look at, at the works he did or the projects he realized, that he's driven by ambitions uh, for both social and architectural renewal, which is, I think, quite remarkable. Notable achievements um, are, are the very innovative redevelopment of the, um, of the Vajantlaan in, in The Hague, uh, but also uh, the, the controversial City Hall in The Hague by Richard Meyer, both projects of which, personally, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, also, it, it's, they seem to be it's maybe a contradictory term, socially motivated grand schemes in a way. If you, if you, I don't know if you know the Vajantlaan, but to me that term applies very strongly. Um, and next to mentioning that Adi Duiverstein was, uh, um, uh, was director of the National Institute of Architecture and was a member of Dutch Parliament, it's maybe also good or only fair to say that he's also the chair of the board of SCORE. In his presentation, he will take us from Amsterdam to Lima and to Almere, and he will argue that a clear framework, be it politically driven, involving uh, spatial, social, or juridical rules, and entrepreneurial freedom, 
both together embody an ideal fundament for urban social housing. Next speaker is Miguel Robles Duran. I hope I pronounce it well. Um, he is an, uh, he, he just um, arrived in the Netherlands after having been uh, involved until yesterday, I think, with um, uh, the, uh, the Occupy movement in New York. Um, he, uh, he, he's an ur urbanist who actively uh, engages with um, urban asymmetries, as, as also the title of his book is. He's addressing political, spatial, and social aspects of, one could say, uneven or unfair or conflictuous urban development. Um, he will talk about um, the relation of housing with uh, the current economic crisis. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe he narrows down his talk also to the, to the Dutch context. And um, um, it will probably also deeply influenced by, by recent happenings. Uh, sadly enough, Dutch architects and partisan public who were announced uh, as the third party, uh, they are not able to be present here. Uh, being abroad and being ill. Sadly enough, Christian Ernsten had to, had to cancel this morning because he has a high fever. So, this gives me a chance. Um, <clears throat> before inviting the first speaker um, to the stage, um, I thought I'd introduce the topic and um, suggest some, some notions, keywords, that, that might support a cultural or artis artistic perspective on the, on the topic. I know I can never replace Dus and partisan public, I will never uh, aim to do that, but maybe, um, I don't know, maybe it touches upon some of the issues that they are also uh, working with. Maybe it causes confusion, but then confusion is a creative power, isn't it? Um, I will use a few examples of, uh, for illustration, and um, I, I shamelessly uh, took Strom as a, as a source, because that was, at that point, the most easy thing to do. Art can be, I would say, art can be a, a propeller or a catalyst of involvement of citizens with their environment. It can do so by creating consciousness and stimulating ownership or co-ownership on a mental level rather than an economic or financial level. I use the word environment deliberately because housing is about community and community connects to the public domain. You could argue that the quality of the public domain indicates the social quality of housing. A further drive for the commitment of citizens is a sense of urgence, I think. So these words, um, involvement, consciousness, ownership, urgence, are um, uh, the key words that I would like to address. Um, now I have to do... Yes, now I just have to do this. This, is, uh, this uh, image gives you an overview of uh, a project that Strom recently organized in the month of October. Uh, it's in the area of Erasmusfeld in The Hague, which uh, the city council decided, or the city council decided that, uh, or the city government, I should say, that it should become the most sustainable urban district in the world, they said. Um, it's uh, empty, it will stay empty for a while because of the crisis, but this idea of sustainability uh, is an interesting idea and we, Strom, ha have connected it with the notion of food because that's part of a project that we're involved in for a long time. Our involvement with this area is uh, in two parts, it's a, ch a short-term involvement and a long-term involvement. This manifestation is a short-term involvement. It's a manifestation on food, sustainability and urbanism. It's a very friendly, um, one could say bottom-up kind of uh, urbanism. Uh, what we did, we basically uh, lay out um, um, uh, an infrastructure, a very basic infrastructure that, um, that covers uh, functions, several functions like, for instance, um, a food factory, which, uh, where the building produces itself. So the building is and produces food. And it also contains a restaurant, there's a garden, there's an outdoor brewery that uses local water, in this case from the ditches surrounding the area, to, uh, 
to produce excellent uh, beer. Uh, and there were some other functions. There were workshops, some housing facilities, etc. The long-term involvement also starts here. Uh, we've asked uh, Studio Mocking Bay to develop um, a long-term policy how, uh, that could be the basis for the urban development of this area. And they came up with a very old, or very old, quite an old Dutch word, Nutsvereniging. It's a typically 19th century word and it could probably best be translated as uh, association for the common good. I don't know, I don't know if this is a, a but it's the best that I uh, could come up with. Associations for the common good as a basis for urban development. So what they do, they take people as a starting point. People starting the conception based on ideological and political ambition, organization and realization of infrastructure as one could say seedlings for public space and uh, various functions attached to it. And um, this the one that's, uh, um, association is about clean water. The next one is uh, about uh, compost and there's one about energy. But this is very important. Urban development starting with people involved and people involved, members of these associations, could be as diverse as interested individuals, housing corporations, project developers, um, um, allotment gardeners, beekeepers, students, etc., etc. The, um, the next image shows a um, um, quite strong resemblance with um, with the last one, but it refers to a completely different period. This refers to the uh, person of Otto Neurath. Otto Neurath, who was a member of the Wiener Kreis. Uh, he was a philosopher, economist, sociologist, um, and he's one of the lesser known protagonists of the modernist movement, I would say. But lesser known doesn't mean less important. I think uh, his, his importance cannot be overestimated. Um, he, one of the things he did is that he established the Gesellschaft und Wirtschaftsmuseum. That's the museum for um, sociology and economy, society and economy. And uh, the, the, this museum uh, presented schemes like this. The aim of the museum is to inform people about the powers and the processes that were underneath their lives and that sort of brought about their lives. So he tried to make visible the, to many people, invisible powers that, um, uh, that determined people's lives. And he did this through very simple means. Uh, he called this isotype. It's um, uh, an international standard of typographic picture education. So there's a strong educational component in it, um, as well as a strong emancipatory uh, element in this. The museum uh, didn't have its own building. You can see here, um, uh, here it takes place in the, in the, I think it's the city hall. Uh, so he would just build up uh, exhibition um, um, material. It could be in a post office in the city hall, and uh, he would show this to the public, or maybe even to the crowd, or maybe even to the masses. Um, he was an activist as well. He developed with um, um, some architects. Uh, he developed the so-called after the after the, uh, the the First World War, uh, the so-called Kernhäuser, which is core houses, which basically were a twofold thing. One is an, an um, information how to build a house and two uh, materials to build the core house. The idea of the Kernhäuser is that you start with a, a core and then you ex can expand the house just according to your, uh, to your um, um, income or, or the money or the materials that you have available. It's very important to stress that he involved both visual artists and um, 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 and architects in his work. 
Santiago Cirugueda, um, if you, he, he's often labeled as a guerrilla architect, um, has a very strong activist um, um, ambition. Uh, his, his works could be described as procedures for, for singling out empty areas in urban space and uploading them with a purpose through improper use, very often. He, he stretches the limits of legality in order to find illegal loopholes. Uh, there, he does this by exploiting administrative or gaps in, in the administrative structure uh, and official procedures. And um, he, he is very often teaching homeless or illegal people strategies to occupy public space. And not for one day, not for a few weeks, but for um, a very long time, sometimes even permanent times. He has some very nice um, uh, videos that illustrate uh, his work. These are images of a few, a few projects, and this is her, his website, where you can see that always next to, to a, de a design of a, of a project is a, um, a, a text that indicates these, uh, these loopholes and, and the ways to overcome ad, ad, administrative uh, barriers. Then I'm uh, I, I was thinking, isn't this all becoming too, I don't know, too positive or too neat? Or don't we need something else as well sometimes? And I think sometimes you need antagony, sometimes you need inaccessibility. Why do you need this? Um, you need this to overcome one of the biggest dangers, I think, is uh, indifference. Um, if you want to involve people, then indifference is, is the enemy to beat. And to beat indifference, you need sometimes bold statements. I think, by the way, that, that the, the city hall of, of The Hague is as bold a statement as, um, and therewith a success as this project by uh, Cyprien Gaillard, who's a French artist that we, he, we invited to do a, a, a project in public space. And it basically involved excavating a World War II bunker, part of the Atlantic Wall, um, as... as in a way to lay bare a very brutal, minim as, as a brutal minimalist sculpture. So it was a sculptural gesture, I would say. But um, the location is opposite um, Duindorp, which is a, a district in The Hague, at the sea, um, which was in the process of being... Um, in the process of a socio-economic redevelopment, or a social cleansing, as some people would, would call it. Um, parts were, were being torn down, parts were being built up, and it's, it's this process which is very general, you know, that it's all rental houses and part of the new housing will be um, uh, for sale, so you hope to, 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 to arrange a more diverse, diversified social structure in, in an area like this. But he played it um, uh, uh, as, as a kind of a war, almost. The, the, we, we had yellow digging machines digging off this hill that, that covered the bunker. And uh, the, the project developer uh, had blue digging machines. So he, he, for television, he sort of uh, framed the whole thing as a war between them and us, blue and yellow. And we were the good ones, of course, and they were the bad ones. Um, um, what... It turned out to be, um, um, although he, it was intended by him as a very sculptural gesture with social and political implications, you could say, it turned out into a storytelling machine. This is one of the first days, I think, uh, but it, it was open for five or six weeks and all the time of the day and the night there were people on top of the bunker. The hill that was there has had exactly the same views at the sea. The, Physically, the space was exactly as it always had been. But apparently, by turning this through this brutal gesture into this uh, situation, it became a storytelling machine. Uh, this involvement of the, cit of the citizens was really strong um, uh, because, because it was impossible to stay indifferent to this thing in your back garden. Um, so compared to the first image, this is, you could call this a very unfriendly uh, gesture, but uh, it, it certainly 
displays a sense of urgency, I would say. And this, this storytelling quality is potentially uh, uh, the seedling for, for organization, for action, and for development around it, I think. Um, this is my last um, image. Um, involvement, consciousness, ownership, urgency. I repeat them once again. Before I ask um, uh, Mr. Adri Davestein uh, to the stage, I would like to propose that uh, after each of the lectures of Adri Davestein and, uh, and Miguel, we, we take a few minutes for informative questions, so if things are not clear or whatsoever. And after the two talks, we take some time for more discursive questions for debate discussion. Is that okay with you? Yeah? Okay, Adri Davestein, may I ask you to come on stage? Well, thank you very much. Um, well, it's a big uh, step, I think, from going to the uh, introduction to my story, but I, um, I like to speak about um, the issue is social housing and housing the social, um, but um, and my part, especially, is the right to self-organize. And um, in Almere, we are working in what you can call uh, to a new model uh, of um, planning. Um, and that model is very um, connected, very strong connected with the, uh, the, the civic society. And it's a, a really... Um, uh, shift with uh, with our Dutch tradition, and I like to talk a little bit about that. And therefore, um, I use three examples. But first, let's talk about the uh, the definition of uh, social housing and housing the social. Uh, for me, um, is this the most um, is the most important uh, question. Can the right to self-organize help a city to be a basis for a society? To stimulate people to meet each other and to lead to a broad range of activities. And when well, we just heard it's the story of um, uh, Arnold uh, Reindorp, and um, I like the idea of, uh, of the bazaar, eh? because the bazaar is, is really um, well, you can uh, you can use it as a metaphor for 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 the city uh, where all uh, kind of activities come uh, together and where people meet each other and what is really a place for uh, for the society itself. Uh, just from that point of view, I agree with his uh, uh, definition. Um, that's also maybe it's not my definition, but it's also my idea about the, uh, the, 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 the the view that I have for uh, some new neighborhoods in uh, Almere. Um, let's try to answer the question. Uh, the question for me is uh, the, the right to self-organize, to help a city to be a basis for a society, to stimulate people and uh, to create that uh, broad range of activities. Um, I like to use three examples. Eh? The, the canal zone, we are part of it today. Um, and then we go to Villa El Salvador of uh, Lima in Peru. And, um, and of course, then it's normal that you go back to Almere. Um, the <coughs> but let's go to, uh, to the canal uh, zone. Uh, the kennel zone, when you talk about um, uh, making cities, the, the kennel zone of Amsterdam is really a planned uh, um, um, uh, idea of, 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 of making uh, cities. It's, it's a plot-based urbanism. Uh, for instance, it's a framework, and that framework creates a maximum of freedom for entrepreneurship, and uh, I think it's very fascinating that uh, that, that framework also create a unity, and at the same time, it, 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 it is an invitation for diversity. Um, and when we look to that framework, uh, and it's, uh, I, 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 I think it started in 1500, 
95 or something like that. Uh, when you look to that uh, framework, it's really a plan. Uh, 300 years ago, uh, they made a plan like we do today or uh, like the grid in uh, New York or, uh, well, uh, name uh, other uh, uh, cities. This is, this is not an organic uh, idea of making city is when, when we look to the, uh, the, the main framework, but it's really a, a plan. It, it's, it, everything is defined in the, the whole uh, structure. But the, maybe the most fascinating thing of it is that it is a framework and it creates a possibility for entrepreneurship, for, uh, for people to, to, to fill it in. This is, the, uh, this is a painting from uh, 1671, um, from Gerrit uh, Bergheide. Uh, it's the band of uh, uh, the Herengacht. It's nearby, uh, this, uh, this place, and, it is, uh, and, the, and the picture is more than uh, 340 years old. Can you imagine that, 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 that this picture is 340 years old and it's still the same structure and uh, there are still a lot of uh, houses from that period, uh, but at the same time it's maybe uh, converted uh, completely uh, in, in, in when you look to the use of uh, uh, the, the, the different houses. This, for me, it's, it's fascinating as a, as a, as a city, of, as, 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 a, as a city councillor, as a city alderman, um, as, as, um, as somebody who is responsible for a lot of commissions, um, that it is possible that you can create a structure um, that give people the possibility to, uh, to, to create something and at the same time that you create a structure that, um, that, that works not only for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. Uh, today, when we look to our housing program, mostly we talk about 50 years uh, for, for a house when we look to the ex ex exploitation of a house. Now, in this case, you are really creating a very uh, sustainable uh, structure. And until today, you see the uh, Felix Meritus, you can recognize it there on the, uh, on the roof. Until today, it's, it's one of the ma most fascinating uh, uh, cities or part of the cities in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the world. The White Building is uh, the Opera House and uh, the City Hall. Uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's really... <clears throat> well, I take some time because I think it's important to, to, uh, to try to understand how it is possible that, 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 that you create a structure that really exists three, four, five, six hundred years after uh, the, 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 the start, and that it still works as a bazaar, as, as a city where uh, the, the society really has, uh, where the, the society really uh, uh, can function, and uh, where all kinds of activities during the time, uh, changing activities, uh, um, find a place in it. When we look to the housing policy um, and the planning tradition in the Netherlands, um, from the Second World War, it's very supply driven. And making cities in the Netherlands is not anymore an organic process, or it's not anymore a process of uh, the people itself, but it's, it's becoming uh, really a an, an, an process of developers and corporations. Uh, there is a complete disconnection in the process of building of our own house, and not only our own house, but also the, uh, the, when you talk, uh, talk about other uh, uh, activities, it's no longer ours. Uh, the production is really monopolized, and everybody received this map, and, and when you, for instance, when you look to the uh, map of, uh, of Amsterdam, um, and it, the, 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 the map shows um, all the um, houses 
that are related to the uh, social housing program and to the housing associations. Um, and when you really look to this, uh, to this map, it's maybe the, the, the largest landlord there ever was in the Netherlands. Uh, that's our housing corporation system. And for instance, when you look to this place where we are now, uh, the canal zone, um, there are not so many houses who were owned by the, uh, by the social housing corporations, but uh, the most part of it is private. And um, for a long time, it was in the Netherlands, it was a very positive uh, aspect eh, because we had that social uh, tradition and that planning, the planning uh, machine. But the, our housing, in my opinion, and, and I'm criticizing that uh, for a long time, our housing production is becoming more and more a money, a money driven process. Um, and it has nothing to do with, uh, the, with, with creating your own environment, creating your own house, or uh, really creating a city. Uh, it's a money-driven process. And when you look, for instance, to, our, uh, to, the, to the new neighborhoods, uh, the post-war neighborhoods, um, they are mostly the same, and only the, uh, the, the facade is uh, different. And the architecture is, is, is also mostly limited to the uh, facade. And I'm, I'm always surprised that a lot of architects, or may, maybe the most architects, even the, 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 the famous one in the Netherlands, that they accept that. Uh, that they accept that, they, that their job is really reduced to creating just the facade and the, uh, the, the, and, 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 and the, the, the inside, the floor plan of uh, the house, is mostly the, the same, maybe 80% of the production. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a little bit strange because um, in, when I, for the, for the most people, uh, the Netherlands and especially abroad, the social housing program is connected to the people itself, but in my opinion, there is no connection. Yeah, of course, the, the corporations are working for the people, but seldom with the, the people. And uh, our housing program is not connected to the people itself in, in terms of that it is really something of their, uh, by themselves. <coughs> In 1994, uh, I made an exhibition um, uh, for the Dutch Architecture Institute, and um, that exhibition was a kind of research of five cases. Uh, and the title of that uh, exhibition was The Hidden Assignment, and the main aim was to search what the role of architects are, the, uh, what the role of professionals are in uh, well, self-built uh, structures uh, uh, and favelas, uh, uh, neighborhoods like that. For instance, Lima, uh, Bangkok, Santos, Yogyakarta, and Kramstown. And um, I was really surprised that, for instance, in Lima, and I will use that uh, Lima case, I was really surprised that in a country Without money, when you talk about the uh, housing program, uh, Peru, um, and a city, Lima, without money for that housing program, and people without money, that, uh, that, that in that country and that specific city and uh, with the people there, that, um, that there is a neighborhood based on plot urbanism, see it as the canal zone, in Amsterdam, uh, based on uh, plot urbanism, site and services, that, um, that the government there invite the people for self-organization, and that in that um, uh, neighborhood, of in, in that city, a neighborhood grows for, well, I, I suppose, 100,000 houses, and it's really uh, immense. And here you see that they only use this framework. Uh, in the middle, the public space, and, um, 
and you see all those, uh, uh, it's, it's defined in, 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 in small plots, um, and everybody has the, the possibility to, well, to buy a plot like uh, that and start with his own house. This is shop, a uh, shop for building materials, and this is really the start of, uh, of that building process. And, um, and here you see the, the, the uh, well, one uh, house, and that house is under construction, of course, but the, on, the, on, on the ground floor, people uh, has the possibility to live there, and they are, well, the house is still uh, growing. Another one, th these pictures are from 1994, uh, uh, another one of another example, and, um, and that neighborhood of 100,000 houses is still under construction, and it's still growing and growing and growing. And, um, and there is some uh, funny thing of it, because when you look to the floor plan, the framework, each side is bigger than a house in the Netherlands where people pay 300,000 uh, euro uh, for it, and, 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 and the only differentiation that they got is that fantastic uh, architectural facade. Um, and here, is in this city, is every house different? And every, everybody is using his creativity, his entrepreneurship, and is looking to his own situation, uh, the family situation, or the, 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 the connection with, uh, with work, and uh, create his own, um, um, uh, create his own house. And it's, this is also an old picture of uh, 1994, but I'm, 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 I'm sure that when, when we make that picture now, the, uh, the whole uh, area is, 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 is ready. Uh, and, of, and, 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 and ready is, is never, uh, in Lima it's never ready, but it will be under construction always. But in here in Amsterdam, at the Kennel Zone, when you walk, uh, take a, sh uh, a small walk, and uh, you see all kinds of activities there, and it's, it's in, in principle, it's the same. And I was fascinated by, by, by this example because I went to Lima to, with the idea that, that the people need the help of the professionals. And I came back with, 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 with the experience that uh, the people there um, that the enthusiasm of, uh, of them, the, the energy, the creativity, uh, the power of the people, that, that they are maybe much more important for that idea, that concept of the bazaar, eh, than uh, our housing cooperations and the uh, developers uh, who are mostly uh, of very, uh, from both of what is it, but, uh, the, the, uh, top down uh, with a top down structure or a very money uh, with, a, with a very money driven uh, process and for me it means that 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 i'm um, that i'm really believe in the right to self organize when you when you talk about the uh, city planning and the and the and the future planning in the netherlands uh, um, uh, and that means that, 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 that I introduce in Almere the Almere principles, and one of the Almere principles are empower people to make the city. And we start in 2006 a program, I built my house in Almere, um, and the, 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 we give the, the people the opportunity to create their own, their own home and uh, their living environment. And, in the Netherlands, all the professionals, uh, Arnold Reindorp also showed a, a spot uh, print eh, uh, of the professionals, all the professionals are always uh, putting that statement that for people they don't like to build their own house because it's too complicated it's, uh, and it's too expensive and, uh, um, and, and it creates a lot of divorces. Uh, it's better that... Uh, it's, it's better that, 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 that we do that uh, job and that's for the people, it's, the, it's, it's more easy. Um, and we started with this neighborhood, and the name is Homeres uh, Quartier, and it's also an urban structure, and the urban structure is not important. It's, it's, it's just, it can be, uh, it's possible to change that structure, you can use every structure, but 
uh, this structure was made by, by the, the office of Rem Kohas, eh, OMA. And, um, the, and we started with this uh, neighborhood, and it's a neighborhood of 3,000 houses. And, um, and in the circle, within the, in the circles, there are 1,500 houses where people have the possibility to build their own house. And, uh, and we created a lot of differentiation so that we have really the experience of, 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 of all kinds, the, the, the whole mix of uh, houses, the types of houses. And we just started in uh, 2008, in February. Uh, and in May 2009, you see that, that it's, it start, uh, it's growing, May 2010, in January 2011, and, and, and the neighborhood is still growing. Every day, and, 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 and maybe the, the most fascinating thing of it is we don't know what, 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 what the image will be uh, at the end because we, 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 we have no idea what people like, or what people want. Uh, but we give that possibility and suddenly in uh, Almere, more than 1,500 households were building their own house. And, of course, when they, they force, we have a lot of other plots for them. But, uh, but here you see um, that people are really living in an area that is not uh, finished uh, yet, and it, and, it, and, it, and it works. This is a small plot. It's, it's, it's interesting because sometimes we, uh, we give one rule. For instance, in this case, we give the rule that it's only possible to build in wood or with wood. And suddenly you see a small uh, neighborhood in that, big, in that larger area, and all the houses are wooden houses, and it gives a fantastic differentiation. Um, and it, we had only one rule. Um, there is also another neighborhood where we uh, said, well, you, you can build your own small house in a garden. And the garden is more important than the house. And how you do it, it's not our uh, it's not our responsibility, it's your idea. Another uh, sentence uh, that we, another, another rule that we gave in another part of that area is I build sustainable, and, uh, but we do not describe what sustainable uh, is. And people have, have, have uh, ideas about sustainability that goes much further than we uh, can imagine. And it's also interesting when you look to the architecture, that people are, um, architecture is maybe not the, architecture in the, in, 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 the, in the meaning of art is maybe not the first aspect in this uh, neighborhood, but suddenly there is a house with a roof and a top floor uh, like you see here, and nobody knows why. But it, 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 there, there was no artist, there was no, uh, no planner, but suddenly it's there, and it changed really the whole uh, facade, the whole image of that uh, area. And it's fantastic. This is, this is, this is uh, somebody who is connected with uh, Suriname, uh, a Dutch colony, and, well, that commissioner built his house strongly connected to his uh, earlier experiences. And this, from that point of view, it's, it's, it's not necessary to talk about architecture, uh, but architecture and art is really, in my opinion, part of, that, of the energy of the people itself. Housing, social housing, housing the social, uh, in, in, the, in the most uh, uh, narrow meaning, we also create the possibility that people build their own house, but also the low-income people has the, uh, the, the possibility to build their own house. And suddenly, the, we had a very strange experience because when we talk about social housing in the Netherlands, it's always necessary to, to have a lot of money to subsidize that houses, otherwise it's not affordable for people with a low income. Uh, and here people are building their own house without any subsidy. 
There is a special loan, but, but, but there is no profit to the people, there is no subsidy, there are no uh, supplements. Um, and people are building here their own house, and, and it's affordable. And it's, and, and it's a little bit strange, because all those housing corporations are explaining every time that they need 60,000 uh, euro for each house that they will build for lower income people. And here are the lower income people building their own house without any subsidy. And it says something about the professionals. This is the, uh, and of course you can talk about the, uh, the, the, the architecture, right? it's, it, it, but that's more an, a personal question. For instance, I, I know that there are a lot of fantastic uh, uh, designs but people are mostly a little bit conservative and choose that, that type of dis, the, the science. But maybe that's an, 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 another part of the program in the future, that you, that you help people or that you motivate people to take more chances. Um, and the last aspect of this story is that it is, um, when you, it's independent of the crisis. Eh? We have a, a, an enormous crisis, a, a financial crisis, economic uh, crisis. But when we look to our housing program, the developers and the housing corporations, that program is completely down, it's out. But when you look to our program for the private commissioners, it's still rising. And it's, it's, a, it's a funny contradiction. And my explanation is, is, is quite simple. People are uh, looking to how much money do I have? And, I, and I'm looking for a plot that connects with that budget. And, uh, well, from that point of view, there is always a possibility to, to, to invest. And a developer do not have that possibility because he must create first his profit, and therefore it's necessary to sell 70% of the project, otherwise his project is, is, is not uh, protected. And, um, and therefore, you see that, that, that the crisis for the developer means no, uh, taking no uh, risk. Well, to uh, finish the, the story, eh, can, can the right to self-organize help a city to be a basis of the society and stimulate people to meet each other and uh, to lead uh, to a broad range of activities? Eh? Now, well, the, for me, is the answer, of course, that Amsterdam, Lima, uh, the Almere's quartier in Almere, that, um, that self-organization uh, really the key to sustainable urban development uh, is. And the right to self-organize leads to a long-term connection between people themselves. And, uh, what, and that's what's being built. That's really demand uh, driven And to a creator, variety and quality. The diversity is, is immense in, in, in architecture, in housing types, but also in functions. And, uh, in the center of that Homeres quartier, we are now building, the people are building, with the, the system of the Baugruppe, the, 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 the Duitse methode, uh, they are building uh, houses uh, where, where on the ground floor always are public activities. And the, this, the, that concept of the bazaar, it's really possible to, uh, that you create a bazaar in a suburban area. Well, and it's a nice statement to finish my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't think it was very far from the introduction. I think there were several subjects that you touched upon that were already in the introduction. Um, are there any questions uh, in terms of things that were not totally clear or that you want to have some... Excuse me, she was first. I keep the microphone. Uh, hi, I'm Isabel. I come from Brazil and Sweden. I'm an artist. Um, I was a bit unclear. I uh, found it very interesting, you know, the Rem Koolhaas uh, planning, the round circular moat around this neighborhood, and the fact that it was a tabula rasa, that you begin with a tabula rasa with the plots and then people can sort of build as they wish. But I was a bit confused about, um, I think you're very emphatic about the visual differentiation and also the economic, uh, you know, different modes of financing or self-financing and, and therefore self-organization. However, I wasn't clear about the social differentiation of this area 
because it seemed when you, you showed the, you know, the, the, the less fortunate, the, the less, uh, let's say, the less, the cheaper housing, the people who build with, you know, 30,000 euro or 20,000 euro, but it seemed like they were all together. I mean, is there any kind of mixture also socially and financial in terms of income in this new neighborhood? I wasn't clear about that. Um, I try to understand what the question is. Is the question the differentiation of income or the, the social differentiation uh, of the society? I think that goes together, no? <laughs> yeah, because the, um, the, the, that's the interesting... Uh, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in our system, um, we, have always, we separate always the houses of middle class and lower income houses. Uh, we have a very strict idea of this is lower income houses, this is... Uh, houses for middle class or uh, richer people and um, uh, I think the, the fascinating thing of uh, uh, the Romero's quartier is that there that everything is uh, coming together there it's really an integrated society where where all the uh, um, where there is an, an enormous differentiation there are houses um, uh, there are plots um, of 600,000 euro, then you build there a house that's, that, that, is, that you need a million uh, to, 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 to build a house there. And, at, and, and nearby, the people of the, uh, with the lower income build the houses uh, nearby that, uh, that plot. It's from that point of view, there is a large differentiation. And, uh, but you do not recognize social housing as social housing. It's a funny aspect of it, because people because it's, it looks like, um, um, it really looks like a an, an, an street that is, that, is, that, is, that is much older than, uh, than, than, than the, the new building that it's just built. It's, it's a funny contradiction that, that when people are visiting the neighborhood, they are, they, 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 in, in, in their idea, uh, the neighborhood is much older than the, the reality is. Is this a good answer to your question? Uh, how's the divorce rate? <laughs> Until now, eh? <laughs> I was, uh, uh, I gave, once I gave an answer to, uh, to, the, uh, um, to the developers that, and, and I was looking to the divorce rate of Almere and well, that's, 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 that's really high and uh, I said, well, you are responsible. Right? That's the, we have proven that the developers are responsible for the divorce rate, but, but they are really using, it, it, and, and that's funny, but also the professionals of the social housing cooperations, um, they, they are really using a lot of um, uh, excuses because in, in the Netherlands, it's their domain. It's not something of the people itself, and it, for the people it's possible to well, to talk in a meeting, of course, eh, to have some, what we call the inspraak, eh, medezeggenschap, eh, you have the possibility to participate, but you are not really part of that decision-making process. And it's, it's funny because, in the, in, especially in Amsterdam, uh, before the Second World War, we had a year, a lot of cooperations, and not cooperation, but cooperations, and, and co the, the essence of uh, a cooperation is that it is really of the people who are the owners of the of, 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 of the houses and I I believe very strong in that system I don't believe in uh, uh, I do not believe in, 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 in that in that in that paternalistic system that we that we have of course for some groups maybe it's necess it's necessary but not as, 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 as a principal system, and especially not in the future, because there is no shortage of houses here anymore in the Netherlands. Of course, there are problems, but our problem is more the quality of the houses and not the, the, the amount of houses. There's one question here. You showed that you were good at statements, but now a question. Is it only uh, residential? Is it also possible to have a mixed professional residential uh, uh, shops on the on the? On yeah, the, on the it's everything, the, the, and that's 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 
maybe a little bit uh, difficult in the presentation, but we are talking about houses, we are talking about uh, uh, the, the combination of work and uh, living. Uh, the, the, we are talking about, we just started one week ago with what we call a program, I built my shop in Almere. Uh, and uh, especially because we go to the, 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 the people who are, uh, also an entrepreneur who uh, starts a shop, he, he must always, he or she must always rent that, uh, uh, that, 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 that part from, uh, from a developer or an investment uh, company. And what we, what we really try to, to, to do is to, to go back to the people who are um, responsible for, and who are living and working in that uh, in that area, but also in the in the in the in the in the in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the goed, eh, in the real estate. Uh. Last one. I have a very simple question: uh, Who owns these social houses later on? Is it the, the long-term lease, or are they the, the private property afterwards? The, the people who build their own house are the owner, uh, are the owner of the uh, house. Eh? There is no, uh, there is no uh, institution. There's the direct connection. People pay to, uh, the pe people must pay also the the the, 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 the final price, eh? the right price. Ari Duivstein, thank you very much. Please take a seat here. And uh, I'd like to give the word to Miguel Robles Duran. I think I'm going to divert even more uh, from, I mean, the, the sort of definition of what uh, the right to organize actually means or is. And uh, if I would be uh, perhaps uh, giving this talk a few months ago, I mean, the, the sort of the basic address that I would go to would be uh, referencing uh, some projects that we have uh, developed in the Netherlands, more specifically in Rotterdam, which is a city that I was leaving until a year ago. Um, uh, regarding, of course, the issues of social housing and uh, these areas that have uh, sort of continuously been polarized by, uh, by neoliberal urbanization, neoliberal development. And uh, I come here representing basically uh, uh, two organizations. And uh, the first one is the, the sort of the cooperative that we were working with, uh, with Emiliano Gandolfi, Lucia Babina, uh, and Gabriela Rendon, myself, uh, which built around issues of um, uh, critical, um, um, dealing with critical structures of urbanization, which are normally left uh, the, for you know, somebody else to resolve it, but basically of the unempowered populations. Uh, not only in the Netherlands, but around the world. Um, the other organization that I'm representing, I'm currently living in New York, and I, um, I was called to design and direct a, a new graduate urban program uh, at the new school. Uh, that is, right now we're calling it urban ecology, it's a master's in urban ecology, which what we're trying to do is to really radically reframe what we mean by the production of city. Um, and uh, what we mean by the development of urbanization in very severe critical moments that we're living on. So while we are all here sitting, I mean, the world is burning as I speak, and I hope that we never lose sight of that. So on that turn, uh, one of my strong decisions to come here and talk to you about, besides, I mean, I, I wanted really at the beginning to talk about the issue of housing, um, it's a much more urgent situation, which I will try to correlate to the production of the city, but it has to do a lot with uh, something that has uh, completely changed my life in the last month and a half, and I'm not joking when I said it has completely changed my life. Uh, I've been very fortunate to get involved and engaged with the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, almost since its inception. And uh, I've been actively uh, uh, helping uh, organize, coordinate, uh, we're a bunch of people. And um, uh, this has completely shifted uh, the position uh, of uh, my practice, but also as an academic, our position as an academic. Most importantly, it has shifted um, our understanding of actually what it's possible to construct uh, in the city. So um, yesterday, talking very informally with Don Mitchell, um, and we were talking about sort of that I wanted to break a little bit the rules and enter into uh, most issues of Occupy Wall Street and what actually that means to the production of urbanization. Um, uh, he basically said, it's easy, you just have to tell the audience that you cannot have um, a different form of housing if you don't first organize or revolt um, to the things that you are right now um, surviving or living. 
And I think this is a very strong part of the movement. So as I said, I represent these two organizations. And the third one, I want to read very closely this because I think it's very important. What you're going to hear from me, um, it's um, something that is very related to this text that is here. It's, I'm going to talk that our movement is not an anonymous movement. Uh, on the contrary, it is conformed by a multiplicity of voices, singularities, and names. Anybody can talk from the movement, and that's myself, that I come here talking from the movement, but not on behalf of the movement. So I'm not talking as a representative of the movement. Anybody can participate in the movement, but not represent the movement. We organize ourselves as movement, we express ourselves as individuals. Right now, I'm expressing uh, as an individual on these things. So I'm going to try to go as fast as possible. I really wish I had you know, tremendous time to really explain, but my idea is to introduce you to the sort of the organizational form, the processes, the structure that the movement has taken in the, the theme of self-organization, and how actually this is helping us conceive a very, very radically different form of urban production, and not only urban production, but of our daily lives in general. Um, um, so I will first uh, read this very briefly. As one, ex one, as one people united, we acknowledge the reality that the future of the human race requires the cooperation of its members, that our system more prote must protect our rights, and upon corruption of, this, of that system, it is up to the individuals to protect their own rights, and those of the neighbors, that a democratic government derives its, its just power from the people but corporations do not seek consent to extract wealth from the people and the earth. And that, we, that no true democracy is attainable when the process is determined by economic power. And I guess, you know, the label today has been, I mean, you look at the news, well, sort of the, the things that they're doing to Greece, it's just, for me, it really pisses me off like hell. And I, I, I think that uh, we all are responsible for this. Um, and, and it's our sort of non-voicing our concern of what the European Union is doing right now. Um, but we can talk about that later. Uh, it says, um, we come to you at that time where corporations, which place profit over people, and I don't think anyone can say that that's not the question here, self-interest over justice and oppression over equality run our governments. We have peacefully assembled here as it is our right to let these facts be known. First fact, they have turned our homes into pure fictitious capital, a speculative instrument made for the market and hardly for living. They have taken bailouts from taxpayers with impunity and continue to do so without any democratic frame. And that applies, though everything that I'm going to say here applies to the Netherlands as in any other European country. They have perpetuated inequality and discrimination in the workplace based on age, the color of one's skin, sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Living here, I can understand that this is still a very, very big fact in the Netherlands. They have poisoned the food supply through negligence and under undermined the farming system through monopolization, also very applicable. They have continuously sought to strip employees of their rights to negotiate for better pay and safer working conditions, very applicable. They have held students hostage in debt and mediocre knowledge, very applicable. They have consistently outsourced labor and used the outsourcing as leverage to, court, to cut workers' benefits and pay. And I wanted to add here, of course, what's happening right now to the culture frame here. Um, they have influenced the courts to achieve the same rights as people, with none of the culpability or responsibility. They have privatized our health. What happened here? They have sold our privacy as a commodity. They have used force to prevent real freedom of the press. They have undemocratically determined economic policy, despite the catastrophic failures of their policies have produced and continue to produce as we speak. They have donated large sums of money to politicians who are responsible for regulating them. They have continued to block alternative forms of energy to keep us dependent on oil and other biofuels and things that have been developed as part of the same economy. I would add to it. They continue to block generic forms of medicine that could save people's lives or provide relief in order to protect investments that have already turned a substantial profit. They have purposely covered up oil spills, accidents, faulty bookkeeping, and inactive ingredients in the pursuit of profit. They have purposefully kept people misinformed and fearful through the control of the media. They have perpetuated colonialism at home and abroad. They have participated in the torture and murder of innocent civilians overseas. 
they continue to support international forces that submit other states to their playful will. They have transformed our cities to their own image and profitable will. Almera. <laughs> Stockholm, audio. I need the audio Rome, please. Toronto, Chicago. City people work harder, make more money, and attract more investment than the dwindling numbers who live outside of them. In Italy, for example, the single city of Milan represents 40% of the national economy. Cities pull in the young and the highly skilled, and when they bring businesses and universities together, they spark innovation, most of the time. The OECD has been studying 78 cities around the world and has found a link between the success of a city and its size. There is a positive correlation between size and income. However, when these cities become mega cities with um, having a population of more than 7 million inhabitants, this correlation becomes negative due to many factors, including essentially congestion cost, uh, pollution to many people, problem of transport and so on. But if they solve the problems with new transport systems, for example, cities can keep getting bigger, richer and more powerful. Competition between cities is getting as sharp as the competition between nations, and successful old world cities like Helsinki and Barcelona are facing a new challenge from the east, from Hyderabad and Shanghai. How to keep their advantage is really to constantly innovate, to um, implement policy that will, for instance, uh, increase the leakages between firms and uh, universities, and also if you want to attract people, you need to provide an attractive environment. Think of the competition to host the Olympic Games, but for investment, tourists, and the brain power of an increasingly mobile global workforce. A fight fought with gardens, architecture, sleek new transport systems, modern art museums, that should mean that the most competitive cities of the future will also be the most agreeable to live in. John Lawrenson, OECD TV, Paris. I mean, the big question here is agreeable to live in by whom? No. I mean, the video that you just saw was produced by one of the foremost advice uh, neoliberal bodies. Uh, uh, it's called the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, which uh, cites 78 world cities, and in order to uh, put them into the frames of privatization, I mean, all basically the neoliberal nostrum of applying sort of that type of politics in the production of the city. Now, out of all of these, those cities that would be the most competitive, that would be, you know, the most whatever these people uh, argue or say, it's a pity that the, the, the projector does not work because it's um, good data here. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a, a group of people from the ETH in Zurich, um, uh, based, mainly uh, physicists, uh, a bunch of really important scientists that sat the task uh, to map the world economic power uh, in the most sort of scientific form available. Not only like people like us are always bitching around that the corporations are taking over our world. Well, these guys basically said, okay, let's see if it's true. No. They came out with a, tab, with, a, with a tab that basically says that 147 corporations, 147 corporations, world corporations, are right now owning more than 40% of the world's total output. Okay? That's 147 corporations. Now, out of these 147 corporations, the ones that you see, sadly you cannot read all of them, the ones that you see in blue are uh, European, uh, the orange ones are Dutch, uh, ING Group and uh, Ferenigen uh, Egon um, as um, number 41 and position number 45 in the world power uh, structure. Surprisingly enough, I thought it was going to be Goldman Sachs at the top, but it turned out to be Barclays, uh, the one that basically dominates the whole sort of world agenda. So that idea of building cities, housing, uh, um, uh, structures, I mean, basically everything that we have seen change in the last 20, 30 years, uh, take care into that, that agenda of an image of the city uh, onto their name. I mean, the, what they actually feel the, 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 the city should look like. I love this image. I really love this image. And on another hand, they basically keep on telling us, since the deregulation of financial systems in the second half of the 1980s, market-based housing financing has expanded rapidly. Okay. Of course. You know, I mean, the Netherlands is a prime example of that. Residential mortgage markets are now equivalent to more than 40% of the gross domestic product in developed countries. This is huge. No? That means that 40% of the GDP is dependent on the market that, that mortgage system produced uh, in uh, Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, etc. Um, 
And then it's, it goes by saying, but those in developing countries are much smaller, obviously, averaging less than 10% of the GDP. The public role should be to stimulate, and this is, you know, I, this is David Harvey put, frames this very well. He says, well-regulated private involvement. I still haven't seen that well-regulated private involvement yet. Establish the legal foundations for simple, enforceable, and prudent. I mean, David Harvey also addresses this. I mean, they put prudent there. What the hell does prudent mean in, the, in this context? Mortgage contracts is a good start. When a country system is more developed and mature, the public sector can encourage a secondary mortgage market, develop financial innovations, and expand the securitization of mortgages. Occupant-owned housing, usually a household largest single asset by far, is important in wealth creation, social security, and politics. People who own their house or who have secured tenure have a large, larger stake in the community and thus are more likely to lobby for less crime, stronger governance, and a better local environmental conditions. Now, this is the World Bank Development Report in 2009. And this is what we all have been led to believe. Now, I mean, the utmost turn of the Netherlands from you know, having a rental control, a rental-based sort of society, like Switzerland still is, or Vienna, uh, or Austria, in, in, in this sake. And the radical shift of putting uh, the, the incentives for people to start you know, mortgaging, you know, entering the finance industry, to actually make this 40% possible. Now, when people declare things like this, they forget about all the environmental havoc that this issue has created. They forget about all the economic you know, destruction that this has created. They forget about the 1970s, um, in, um, the market crashes in the 1970s, the nationalized banks in Sweden in 1992 that went from overproduction of housing. Um, the, well, the American sort of situation. We've been the last 30 years or even more, you know, in a constant crisis, country after country, because of all this overdevelopment and this belief that we need to own our house. You know. And uh, so far, perhaps the options that we can only think of is rent and own. You know. Or you rent or you own and you rent because you want to have profit. But they have led us to believe that housing is actually, as I put in, the, in that list above uh, of my first sort of uh, lines, is that it is a speculative instrument. It's not a place for living. I mean, we buy houses because, you know, they're going to raise some value. And I think the Dutch uh, quite know what that meant. I mean, when they were first giving their houses and now how much they're worth now. Now suddenly they had 200,000 euros out of nothing. Out of nothing. That's it. So, adding to all of this, I'm not going to go to this list because I know I'm very framed uh, with time, but it's that universal convergence of competitiveness that also has been at the forefront of urban sort of nostrum of urban development in the neoliberal times. I mean, in this case, um, also OECD recommendations that all countries must pursue competitiveness in the global economy, that country ownership is essential, political will is essential. The task of international institutions is to promote national reforms that contribute simultaneously to national, national and global competitiveness. I remember hearing not long ago this, this program that was called Amsterdam, perhaps it's just a fake program, but I, I heard that it was happening here, uh, creative industries and all these type of things that uh, appear with that. Uh, beyond that, in number six, the government must create and maintain a good climate for investment. It must then provide, which is very clear in the Amsterdam, if I was an investor and I come to Amsterdam, I see that city that is where's the conflict, I mean everything is just so pretty, it's a boutique city, because they don't go around what's outside of these very nicely, you know, sort of kept uh, this naified city center, um, which I cannot afford to live in. I, I wish I could, but I certainly cannot afford to live in. Um, it must be then, uh, in number seven, provide an abundant and productive labor force. Public expenditure should be directed to growth and supporting infrastructure and accelerated human capital formation. I think this had to do a lot also with the crisis that Greece is right now pushing through. Entrepreneurship and innovation must be promoted at all levels. And uh, finally, it's one of my favorites, there should be a particular focus on the empowerment of women because they actually you know, saw that you know, women was not, not playing the sort of that development of, the, of, of that economy that these people are pushing us to believe and to think of you know, cities in this way. Like, South Axis wanted to be, perhaps. But the reality is different, right? I mean, this is uh, not long ago, I think this was a week and a half ago, 
where an ex-student, uh, a person that also collaborated with us in cohabitation strategies, sent me this um, cover of the Zeit, uh, where I find the, the sequence from this to this absolutely beautiful, by the way, um, where they are actually saying, you know, ban that you know, just you have to restrict the banks. You know? So the first points that I address to, like they have produced these, they have done that, they have done that. It really refers to the financial system, the financial dictatorship that we are all in. Americans, Europeans, Japanese, Chinese. It's very clear for many people that the European Union has been advocated for, <coughs> advocating for all these uh, corporations to take over Greece, to take over Italy, to take over Spain, Siemens, Deutsche Bank, um, ING, etc. And I know, as it was mentioned, it's not the main problem, right? But it's certainly a problem. You know? So we have this, and now, New York looks like this. This is around Wall Street. All what was supposed to be public spaces. You know? They're totally fenced you know? from emancipatory, totally democratic project of the free market to the demand of citizens to constrain them, to an actual constraint and refrain of these corporations from the absolute public. Um, this is uh, Chase Manhattan headquarters <coughs> over there. The Wall Street, a very famous Wall Street, uh, not long ago, I mean a few weeks ago. Um, the whole uh, southern part of Manhattan is absolutely fenced off out of the fear of citizens that are absolutely sick and tired of all of this, you know, protesting, you know, just uh, b communicating that they don't agree with this. So ultimately, the U.S., and I'm again going to pass very fast uh, with this data, uh, yes, it's at the forefront. Yes, it's in the extreme situation of the world and this polarity. I mean, the red I put, the top 1% of the U.S. have more wealth than the 95% combined, right? Um, this type of data, although not as extreme, has raised quite substantially in all European countries, including the Netherlands. And uh, Britain, of course, I think is the one that leads the most of this type of data. But one of the things that we don't realize is that as we see European cities to be pretty, you know, a lot of the prettiness comes from the developed ugliness in other sides that European countries are exploiting. So we are all in it. I don't like it when I talk to Europeans and say, yeah, but you Americans have a very specific situation. Well, yes, I mean, actually, they have taught us in Europe to, to really not look at ugly stuff, right? I mean, we just go around, everything's perfect, everything's fine. But the reality is that the corporations that are here you know, are producing um, outmost extreme environmental and social havoc all over the world. You know? Corporations like Shell, you know, financing paramilitia you know, in, 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 in Africa. And you all knew about it, or at least WikiLeaks helped us understand this, without, the, in, without absolute impunity, you know, continuing like this. So um, the position is the following. And this is a beautiful poem from one of my incredible uh, idols that I will say who it is after I finish it. And so finally, here we are at the beginning of a whole new era, the start of a brand new world. And now what? How do we start? How do we begin again? And then again, today is the day, and those were the days, and now these are the days, and now the clock points histrionically to noon. Some new kind of north. And so which way do we go? How do we begin again? This is, by the way, Laurie Anderson. So a big question has arisen into the face of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, in the context of this conference, I can perfectly talk about the problems of financial domination of our cities, continuous private surplus allocation and relocation, search for perpetual growth, urban crisis, social crisis, overinvestment. And what Occupy has actually started to produce um, is actually what I believe the only possible alternative out of all of this. I don't know if you have been following, you know, what's going on in there. Uh, perhaps uh, just for the sake of speeding up of this, I want to pass you to this uh, this video. Uh, it's a very short time, video. Like, who are Please the leaders? Talk. Like, well, none none of us are leaders, and we're all leaders, exactly the same. Hey, 
each other's voices. We amplify each other's voices. So we can hear one another. So we can hear one another. And those um, unbelievers, I mean, the, the people that you saw uh, leading these, um, uh, we d develop a system that uh, actually you will never see those persons again doing that. Um, it's a complete rotational system of representation that we call ourselves as facilitators that are actually leading these type of mass uh, engagements. Uh, what I have here in front is actually a map of, um, or a plan of the Occupy site. And um, as you see, it's actually quite small. I mean, the, the, the lower part is the part where um, sort of the occupation takes place, the tents. Not many tents are there. Um, we have a site which is the general assembly area, the green part, flexible areas, and some other tables that are put all over the place. The, the movement has grown exponentially since it began. And at the moment, the General Assembly has 4,395 active members. What means active members is are people that are actually active in certain work groups doing something. Just to give you an example of um, how the members are organized, the structure has uh, developed in a series of uh, committees. You know? uh, out of the biggest ones or most influential committees are the ones that I put right now on this table. And this is as of today in the morning. Um, the think tank committee uh, is 494 members. If you have questions about what the committees are about, because I really don't have time to tell, I wish I, I could tell you what they are about, um, uh, but I, I can't. Um, uh, arts and culture, very surprisingly, is the second largest committee. Now. And now these are people, and I consider myself right now one of those people, that arrived as personalities, as a you know, direct co-director or whatever of a, a non-profit organization or a professor, that had voluntarily begun to dissolve ourselves in the movement. Now. To lose our sort of identity as individuals and try to cooperate to uh, continuous aims and production. One of the things that the media has been saying a lot about the movement is that we don't have demands. And what we return in them, it will say, we don't want to have demands because we're actually producing the things that you should have been producing for a long time. And we're sick of demanding things that will never be done. I mean, if Stalin, as a philosopher said, killed utopia, Obama killed hope. You know? And the death of hope is actually what is producing this type of, uh, of argumentation. So um, I've been very engaged in, um, in the Empowerment and Education Committee, uh, also in the Outreach Committee and Direct Action, etc. And uh, these are committees that are forming the following form. Um, as, as a speaker, we've been working uh, in producing organizational forms that actually can allow us and permit us to develop uh, different uh, appropriations of space where an assembly can go on in a sort of direct democratic way. Um, so far, again, it's good that you cannot read because I cannot take so much time doing this. Um, uh, the, the, the movement, this is the, the organizational form of the um, Education Empowerment Committee. Um, these uh, cells that you see around are subgroups that are dealing with very specific issues. For example, there's one that is called Open Forum, that is the one responsible for bringing superstar speakers like Naum Chomsky or um, Naomi Klein or Slavoj Žižek, which give us a lot of publicity, which is very good. But there are other forum, there are other sort of things that are working on movement strategy, um, on issues of praxis uh, of the movement. Uh, we are right now forming a nomadic university uh, for uh, the movement. And all of these are basically ourselves uh, saying, okay, we don't have free education, we produce our free education. And right now we're already testing in many unempowered neighborhoods around, uh, bringing the best professors that I know of in the whole city of New York, coming together to teach uh, curricula of civic empowerment around. And that is the same issue with, with the committees of housing, you know, that um, all these groups that never discuss between themselves, like groups on homelessness that I'm sure Don is very familiar with, um, groups that are addressing issues of rental control housing, uh, that normally were very uh, polarized between each other, right now under the frame of disintegration, no. under the frame that I am no longer that group that has that methodology that needs to be applied, no. under the frame of the 99%, all these groups have been collaborating in producing very radical solutions to issues of homelessness and to issues of, of actually housing. But what is very peculiar about this is that neither of these movements or these people working together is relying anymore on governmental uh, agendas. It's almost as if a parallel system suddenly started to develop. 
And I think this is what is incredibly magical. It's not a movement as it, we were taught in modernism that something will come and replace something else. In this case, that something is creating a parallel condition where we still operate in the capitalist discourse, but we are trying to generate a parallel forms of organization. These are bas basically the moments, uh, this, this was uh, published, I mean mentioned, but privately, uh, publicly owned public spaces, which is one of the big powers of the movement, which as they say, they're pro publicly owned, they are big areas, they're privately owned, but you can actually occupy them because they're obliged to be open 24 hours. If we were going to be occupying a private space, the New York police could have just instantly uh, removed us, uh, very, very easily removed us. So we are working on these sort of lobbies, these interstices between subway stations and not subway stations, this and that. And um, uh, as we work, this is the Empowerment uh, uh, and Education Committee uh, as we're working. Uh, we always meet at night. Uh, because this is when we can. And um, other things happen, like parents for Occupy Wall Street, etc. Very fast, I'm not going to go into this because you cannot read it anyway. Um, I just wanted to convey the level of organization that one month and a half has achieved. Now, all of these are actually uh, organizational uh, plans you know, that are totally open for people to input and, and modify of the different committees and subcommittees and how they're functioning together. Um, we normally, for example, Empowerment Education Committee, we meet uh, through these groups uh, system. Uh, it's active 24 hours a day, asking people to collaborate, to cooperate, that facilitators are needed, that there's going to be a teaching on some issue, that there's going to be someone touching issues of spoken counsel or, or empower controller, etc. And I want to end with this, uh, which is something, if I am allowed, yeah. I don't know, uh, this uh, is, is, should be three minutes, I think. Yes. This is one of the actions the committee has done so far. So basically, this, I, I, it, it goes on. I mean, I can really give these links to you, uh, but I, out of respect of the, the following speakers, uh, I could really go on for, for some time talking about this. But these things are going on every single day. Uh, the next big one we're doing is on the 7th of November. And uh, I, I cannot say how wonderful it is to be uh, uh, in those spaces. Um, and of course, when we saw this, I mean, we all cried. I mean, we all cry all the time, you know? Because one of the things that the movement is, is doing is basically saying, look, government, you're working for us, right? 
we want this. We're not going to you. No? This is what's sort of a demonstration of that. If you want to con con then negotiate with us, you have to come on our own terms with us because we are basically the ones that are producing the city. We are the ones that are producing the situation. So there's a, really a radical shift in the conception of also even this participatory process that I don't think they're very far from the, thing, the ones I've been in the Netherlands, to tell you the truth. You know, there's this panel, I mean, there's this sort of arrangement around, et cetera. Uh, some experts, as if they were mentioned all over the place. Um, and uh, it's really changing that sort of paradigm. So um, David Harvey, I'm not going to even quote them, but I want to, um, uh, to basically end um, by saying to, to the people of the Netherlands, which I feel that a big part of my heart remained here, we, the New York General Assembly of Comply Wall Street in Liberty Square, or urge you to assert your power. Exercise your right to peaceful assembly. Occupy public space. Create a process to address the problems that we face and generate solutions accessible to everyone. To all communities that take action and form groups in the spirit of direct democracy, we offer support, documentation, and all the resources at our disposal. Join us and make our voices heard. This is a world struggle. This is not an American struggle. We have to stop bitching around, you know, which is something that we all of did. When some people are hanging over there in the street, oh, they're not doing this right. Oh, no, they're just a bunch of hippies, etc. They are there. And we all should be outside also there. This is actually the only moment, I think, an emancipatory moment that we have uh, to actually uh, put our voices in the street. So a few months ago, I would be talking about our recent project, and now I decided to be talking about this. I hope that you understand why I did it. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, uh, you know, address them in any other form. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Miguel, please stay seated if you want. And maybe, uh, Adri Duivstein, I could ask you to come to the front as well. And then we combine things. Um, I have one question, Miguel. Um, there's a microphone here that you could use, and I think it's microphones galore. Why are you here? There's a microphone there. Uh, because I, I, where is it? No? Hello. Uh, first of all, because um, I lived in this country for more than seven years, and uh, it, uh, I had to live in a very uh, sort of treacherous condition, you know, where the University of Delft was being dismantled, uh, completely still continues to be dismantled. The Berlag Institute is totally completely definanced, which were the places where I was operating. And I literally saw the gradual disintegration, not only of the cultural system, but of the housing system, of the health system, of the transportation system, of the mail system, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I always have had that sort of um, uh, feeling, right? Mm -hmm. And every time that I come to the Netherlands is for me a way of coming to terms mm -hmm. to a country that I really love uh, and that I saw slowly disintegrating. And more importantly, that being a foreigner, uh, understanding many things that a lot of my friends didn't be in Dutch, which is the situation that a lot of Dutch still believe that everything's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. that a lot of Dutch still believe that you know, they have this lemma of this paternalistic system, mm -hmm. that everything's going to be okay. I tell you guys, it's not okay and it's not going to be all right anymore. The, the welfare system that everybody was in, it disappeared. You know? So I felt very you know, enticed to come because of this. Yeah. But, be, but you, you, you speak passionately about what happens at Occupy Wall Absolutely. Street. Yes. You're really, you, you touch upon deep emotions in yourself but also in us. I mean, you can hear that from, from the applause. But still you're here in a forum, you're inside. Yes. You call us to go outside. That's what I mean. Why? Why? Well, what do you? What do you bring? No, no we can do it. But <laughs> yeah, but we're not gonna defend and say that we have it in Amsterdam and The Hague and Rotterdam as well. But um, what, what you you must feel that although you said you changed your shift the focus of your talk to what you were originally intended to speak about, but you still you contribute to this, don't you? What, what, what do you think is, is your main contribution to, first, to this I mean, It's clear that without a whole reform on the mortgage system, 
or sort of the financialization of the housing industry, the way it has totally taken over the production of housing of the Netherlands, whether it's these very organized, self-organized systems or not. But ING is still controls, it's still red lines, it's still Avenue M, it still does all these sort of things. What I'm saying is that, I mean, this is our housing. We are the ones that make the city, and I agree totally, you know, what mm. was said in the last slide. I mean, the city is our city. Yeah. No. And um, if we don't commence to demand you know, a radical shift in how we approach the building of housing, which has to be absolutely distant from the financialization, mm. you know, um, and the only thing, the only way I feel it possible is, is through this uh, sort of manifestation so far. You know. but, but, but would you say that what Adri Davstein was talking about, this self-organization, is in a way, I don't know if the word is right, is it, is it mesmerizing? Is, are, we, are we believing in, in um, superficial dreams? When we think that we can self-organize our cities by even if we don't have a lot of money by buying our own houses or building our own houses? Because you seem to be very cynical about it, because you, you, you seem to say, well, you can believe that you own the city, you can believe that you built your own house, but you don't. Yes, that's the reality. And what should we do, referring to the poem? How can we start? Um, I mean, the housing committee uh, right now at Occupy, uh, it's... Uh, been working very strongly um, to, I mean, you have to know that there was a big inspiration to very few philosophical dimensions in the movement. One that has been extremely present, which I, as a sort of a trained Marxist uh, analysis, and Alex, um, I, uh, I was not so into, which is the commons, you know, that argument of the commons, which I think is very popular with a younger generation than my generation. Um, and uh, the idea that if we are the ones that produce the city, let's, let's do it ourselves and let's not depend on you know, these guys determining the policy that is building that. So under that principle, uh, there's been an organization of a lot of uh, planners, architects, uh, civic in in engagement activists, etc., which they're um, actually taking over mm -hmm. the, the production of housing completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, through the utilization of or empowering of domain, eminent domain, sort of basically expropriation uh, qualities of certain public spaces, to the occupation of empty void spaces that the mm -hmm. city has left behind. Uh, there's yeah. a strong squatting background, a lot of movements in there. Um, basically, slowly, uh, tactically, you know, I don't want to say strategy, yeah. tactically, yeah. because otherwise, uh, tactically uh, trying to take over uh, the yeah. production of the city. And we all agree, this is very slow process, and I say this parallel that is right now, like, you know, appearing. Mm. Uh, I am certain that it's just going to go stronger and stronger until the parallel, you know, gets to be to a point. But we're talking years. Adri Dijfstein, would, would, uh, would imagine that uh, in Almere uh, uh, there would be an Occupy Almere group and uh, the, the committee would decide to occupy or squat some of the empty lots and self-organize their own housing there. Well, for me, that's not not not. An, for me, that's not an interesting question. Uh, for me, it is. Uh, yeah, of course. But you? but but uh, I have the privilege to answer the question or not. And but the, in in <laughs> I'm an individual. Eh? Uh, and a politician. In my opinion, there is a parallel between your story and my story. And that parallel is that people will take their own uh, responsibility for their own situation uh, as an individual, but also as a group. And uh, from that point of view, when you look to the Netherlands, to our structure, uh, especially the housing structure, but uh, you, you can also look to the, to, to the health uh, organizations, um, they are not anymore from the people. They started as a, a people organization, but now they are not anymore from the people. And uh, when you look to the Occupy uh, movement, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the biggest issue uh, behind that movement is the disconnection between, uh, for instance, people and politics, or between money and uh, investments. And, uh, that's, 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 that's the problem and what they are trying to do and I agree with that aspect, maybe not a form, but you can discuss that also, but I agree with, with the necessity that it, that, that it is, uh, uh, that, that you really connect uh, real values 
And from that point of view, I, I, in my opinion, my story is not different uh, from your uh, story. There is one uh, uh, aspect that makes it more complicated. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have a populist movement. Eh? You see it also in, 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 in other countries. Uh, a populist, nationalist, uh, racist uh, movement. But when you look to the Occupy movement, they, they, they are not, maybe not populist, eh? and, and, and not racist as, as at all, but they, they, are, they are also um, um, not satisfied with the system. And the, and the system is a system of globalization. Uh, and, that, and that means that national borders doesn't exist anymore and the connection between politics and uh, the, 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 how do you express that? Eh? The, the connection and, 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 and influence eh, from politics is not anymore on the, on, on, on the direct le level. Now it's more important what, what the government in Greece uh, are doing or what the investments of China are. Uh, the, uh, what the decision makers there, and that makes it complicated. And your movement, I, I, I support the idea. Your movement express the, uh, the uh, that, 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 that we disagree with the, the globalization and the power structures. But the end, what is the answer? Mm -hmm. I disagree uh, f fully with the, the, the nationalistic answers, uh, the Wilders mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, movement. But at the same time, it's, it's still complicated because the, the world is becoming one, as John Lennon said. This all must heel to say. But I think I think we can all, even with Arnold Reindorp, agree on the on the fact that we need to connect again. He he used it with his cartoon, where there's loads of professionals, and that the idea of um, of organizers of I don't know which word he used, but that that professionalism is professionalism in a way stepped between the people and their ideals. I think we can agree on that, but if I narrow it down to uh, housing... Um, but do you agree with what, 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 what I said? Ah. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't agree with your view on... Please take a microphone. Sense, take you know? uh, thank you. I mean, I did, did don't agree with... Um, I mean, I, I guess I disagree with your disagreement that uh, that, that the problem with Wall Street is that it's not dealing with the uh, politics. I mean, our, my, our take on this is that uh, we've been trying for so long. I mean, you know, just look at the tradition of protest, the modern tradition of protest in Europe. I mean, France can easily organize through unions and through all these sort of things, two million people to march in one day. I've been in those marches, right? Uh, and uh, Italy, it's all the times organizing and demanding things. So basically, there is that modern ideal, again, that a demand will replace something that has been done. But slowly, also, that has been eroding. I mean, the French today demand that things are kept the way they are. They're not even demanding for change, right? Um, and what is, I think, very peculiar about all of this is that we're literally sick of that. Because it's, we know it's not going to go anywhere. It's literally not going to go anywhere. So we don't take the matters into our hands. And I guess our hands are very small now. You know? But I want to frame that uh, Gandhi once said, uh, I mean, it's perhaps not the best example, but anyway, he's very nice what he said. You know, first they, la first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. I think right now in that sort of, sort of one-two phase, you know, where they're, mm -hmm. they're not ignoring us for sure. The, the whole mm -hmm. debate in the U.S., I think worldwide, shifted because of this, and together with the Indignados and the Democracia Real, uh, uh, also the European movements and some others, like Right to the City movements that slowly have also engaged in this. But uh, it's a different world, and uh, a Dutch friend of mine, uh, which m some of you might know, Daniel van der Velden uh, from Metahaven, we were talking on the phone, uh, he's right now in Los Angeles, and we were talking about sort of how we feel today, and the reception was this, I no longer feel like I am post something. I feel like I am pre something. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that feeling, you know, is what is driving all of us. Before they, you know, frame our pre something, our what's happening, I think we should all take that pre because it really it's a very different era. And as Laurie Anderson puts it very briefly, our question is, you know, which way do we go? You know, how do we begin again? Because Thank you, Michael. There's one question here, and I think there's only time for... If you do it really short, and the answer is really short, we can maybe do two, can't we? Um, I've got one here. It works. 
Thank you. Yeah, first of all, very short announcement. There is an Occupy movement in Amsterdam that has occupied Burstplein since the 15th of October, with general assemblies every day at 6.30. Second of all, a, uh, a workshop tomorrow will be held with representations from the Occupy movement and from the Right to the City movement, so I hope to see you there. My question to both of you, uh, it's actually two questions. One is, at the Occupy Amsterdam camp, there is a problem with housing the social that was quite unforeseen for the activists. That is, for instance, housing the marginalized, housing the people with psychological problems that are also present in this open sphere that is the Occupy camp and it has confronted the activists with a social role, which comes closer to a social worker than a political activist. And I was wondering, in your experience, uh, well, how have you dealt with that? And in uh, a second question to the gentleman over here, uh, I seem to understand that what you said was that the Occupy movement should come closer to, well, financial ways of thinking and politics, and I was wondering whether you would be, agree with the, inversing that where they're saying that the political uh, institutions and financial institutions should actually think about coming closer to the occupied movement. So those are two questions and they, I hope they were short. Smart. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> For me it's difficult because in my opinion, when you look, uh, what's, the, what's the translation for verframing? Uh, estrangement. Hmm? Yeah. Estrangement. Yeah. For, uh, alienation. alienation. Yeah. The, in, in, in my opinion, the, 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 the problem is that alienation the, the, uh, on each level in, uh, in this complicated uh, world. Yeah. The, I like the, the, for instance, I like the uh, globalization. Fantastic, in my opinion. It's fantastic to have contact directly with New York and uh, with China and with, uh, with everything. But it's not only a, a, a matter of social media, it's also a financial, it's also an economy of 24 hours, hour, seven, seven, seven days a week. And, uh, when we, uh, in, 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 and when we talk about a, a, a money-driven world, a money-driven economy, and that's a capitalist uh, economy, um, the, the, it creates also all kinds of structures, you describe them uh, in, my, in my opinion very clear, it creates also uh, uh, all kinds of structures of uh, people who are creating their own money without any uh, work or without any uh, relation to the real uh, values. That disconnection, in my opinion, we are talking about that disconnection. There is no global government. We have no answer on that, uh, uh, on that kind of uh, situations. And from that, uh, also we as politicians, we are uh, organized nationally. But every intervention is internationally. Uh, every intervention is multinational. Uh, just from that point of view, um, in my opinion, there are a lot of questions, not only to individuals, but also to uh, professionals, to politicians, to, uh, and so on. That's maybe not a, a clear answer, but that's my, that's so, so I experience the situation now. Uh, also to give very short, I realize there's time there. Um, the, the people that you see in Sukoti Park have, play a very important role. Uh, they they uh, sort of they're the ones that give the sort of spatial presence to the movement. They centralize the identity, very powerful, taking over Wall Street, etc. But um, the media has also destroyed them. I mean, the, uh, completely. You know, at the moment there are many issues that are beyond you know just being social workers, but that uh, because there's free food, there's heating system, etc. It's been also attracting a lot of uh, mentally ill people. It's been attracting a lot of uh, homeless. But our claim is that, well, they are actually, somebody's the 99%, these guys are the 99%. No, we all are the 99%. We all, I think, are the 99%. So um, in, the, in that way, um, what the movement has done is that there is a whole committee that is busy on working on these, and they rely on the other committees to bring assistance, so, uh, social work assistance, especially for the mentally ill. So there are really social workers inside their plane. But the focus of the movement has been through the work groups. So those things that you don't see, that mass organization of 4,000 people, I mean, 4,000 people are not the supporters. In, in 12 hours, we managed to get 600,000 signatures when they were evicting the, evicting the Sukoti Park a few weeks ago. Um, uh, the march is much more people than 4,000 people come. Uh, but these 4,000 people have been key because they're doing the work groups that are proposing 
and are developing things. As we're doing, we're giving already teachings in unempowered neighborhoods all over the place. You know, we're developing this university. We're, they're dealing with, uh, with social housing issues. So it's actually, I think, the work groups and the capacity of the people uh, to compromise their own beliefs and disintegrating the movement that it's giving the movement the force. So it's not Sukoti. That would be also Miguel and uh, Adri, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your really excellent speeches. Um, I think you are on the same specter. I think in different positions, but you are definitely on the same specter. And I think it's all about how do we organize, how do we start from now, how do we connect? I think these are the main questions to be answered. Thank you. And, and Arno, thank you. From Strom, thank you very much as well. Thank you.